Welcome to the SIBO Doctor Podcast with Dr. Narala Jacoby, a US-trained naturopathic physician and director of SIBOtest.com, an online breath testing service and education portal for practitioners. In this podcast series, medical experts join us to discuss functional digestive disorders, clinical practice, and research as it relates to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and associated conditions. This podcast is intended for SIBO treating practitioners and aims to help educate how we may best serve our SIBO patients. If you're a practitioner and want to learn the basics of SIBO, head over to thecebodoctor.com for SIBO education such as the SIBO Fundamentals course, masterclasses, group mentoring and much more. If you're a patient, please know this information is not intended to diagnose or treat a medical condition. Please ask your doctor before initiating any new treatments. And now, over to Dr. Jacoby and the SIBO Doctor Podcast. Welcome SIBO practitioners to another episode of the SIBO Doctor Podcast. And I'm really excited to have Dr. Ilana Gorovich um, in or online with me today. I've met her a few times uh, through the lecture circuit in the SIBO, uh, during the SIBO symposiums overseas, and she's an amazing naturopathic physician who specializes in inflammatory bowel disease, and I thought this is an excellent topic to talk about in relation to SIBO. She graduated from um, National University of Natural Medicine in 2007 and 8 with both a naturopathic degree and an um, acupuncture degree. And she is the co-owner of two large integrative medical clinics in Portland and is also running a busy private practice specializing in treating inflammatory bowel disease as well as SIBO and IBS and functional digestive disorders. She lectures a lot, teaches a lot, and is really a specialist in the natural treatment of inflammatory bowel disease and has actually been nominated as one of Portland top docs by the Portland Monthly in 2014 and 2016. So very excited to have this uh, specialist on the show today. So welcome, Dr. Gurevich. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure. It's always a pleasure to run into you at these conferences. So last time I heard you speak was actually, um, I think it was the SIBO Symposium, and you really gave this very interesting lecture or presentation about the IBS, what you kind of coined the IBS within the IBD. Can you talk, well, actually, before we go into that, that was actually my original question. I wanted to know how you got into this whole topic, and then we go into IBS and IBD. So I was very fortunate and very unfortunate to, um, I was diagnosed with Crohn's myself at age 19. I probably started having it around age 12, but it took me, you know, like every other Crohn's patient, I saw five gastros before anybody would scope me and they didn't scope me until I was 19. And then immediately after scoping me, they found a pretty severe inflammatory bowel disease and I was hospitalized, um, Within seven days of being diagnosed, I was hospitalized with a fever that wouldn't break. And after spending seven days in the hospital and getting put on ultra high dose of steroids, I was discharged. And I was lucky enough at the time my father was having what I call his midlife crisis. He's a physician and he was just discovering alternative medicine. And so through a series of events, I got referred to a naturopathic physician who saved my life. And um, so, you know, I was 19. I was cachexic. I think I was 85 pounds at the time. I couldn't eat anything. I was in chronic pain. And then after seeing the naturopath from Connecticut, Dr. Jim Sensening, um, a year later, I was living abroad. I was, I had energy. I was like partying. I could eat whatever I want. And I was like alive for the first time in my adult life. And it was after that experience that I continued my own journey to pursue naturopathic medicine with this desire to really help people with inflammatory bowel disease, because the reality is naturopathic medicine is so effective for these patients because whatever you get, whatever I give them, any pill, any food that I give them, they swallow and it goes directly to the part of their body that's sick, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's what started my journey. And I've just been pursuing, you know, more education and GI stuff since I've um, graduated. 
Mm, it's always great to have these personal stories. Yeah. And what a naturopathic superstar to get treated from, from, from Jim Sensenick, yeah. who yeah. is just he an totally amazing, <laughs> amazing elder of the profession. So I'm sure yeah. that's, that's worth a whole other podcast just for that. But yeah, so um, you obviously have personal experience with all that. And then SIBO sort of came on the scene for a lot of mm -hmm. naturopathic doctors like yourself and myself. Uh, about seven years ago now. So how did that change? Or, you know, this is kind of dovetailing into this other question that I had is like, you sort of mentioned how these acute flares of IBD are often related to SIBO. So how did how did you sort that out? It changed everything. Like I am so grateful for Alison Seebecker and uh, the work and the education that she did because personally for me it changed everything. Uh, before SIBO, we would do a lot of diagnosis and testing on large bowel flora, and we would treat what we found in large bowel flora, which was great if you were an ulcer uh, ulcerative colitis patient. However, if you were a Crohn's patient, 80% of Crohn's patients have a disease within their terminal ileum, so the bottom of their small bowel. They might also have disease in other places of their small bowel or their large bowel, but 80% of patients have illness within that end of the small bowel area. And we never really had a way to diagnose what was going on in the small bowel before SIBO. And so it changed everything for me. Hmm. So this would be more... Um, acute flares of Crohn's rather than acute flares of ulcerative colitis? You know, there is some literature that shows that treating small bowel flora does affect ulcerative colitis flares, not as much as what is shown to affect small bowel, um, so small bowel, bowel Crohn's. Mm -hmm. uh, but there does seem to be some correlation with, you know, I think about the intestine as this gigantic orchestra. And, you know, if the front of the orchestra, the stomach, the top of the small bowel isn't working, then the bottom of the orchestra the large intestine is clearly going to have to carry more of the burden and more of the strain. And so because of that, uh, sometimes treating SIBO will absolutely help ulcerative colitis and sometimes it won't. And I do, I, I will honestly at this point say I do treat them differently. I'm much more likely to test for SIBO in a small bowel Crohn's than I am in a ulcerative colitis. I'll start by testing other things and then if I get nowhere, I'll circle around to the possible SIBO at that point. Which, of course, begs the question, what other things do you test for <laughs> that you just mentioned? So, like, I, I mean, uh, mm. uh, large, yeah, so, um, large bowel studies, I think, are really, really useful for ulcer colitis. For, uh, first of all, and I know fecal calprotectins. Should mm. I define what that is? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. For those who, uh, who are unfamiliar with so, it, yeah. Um, a fecal cap protection is a super useful non-invasive test where we're collecting stool and we're looking at white blood cells uh, or leukocytes that are within the small bowel. So it gives me a really accurate sense of how much inflammation is in the intestine. It's useful for both Crohn's and colitis, and it is most definitely how I monitor treatments. My optimal is to... Um, if they're going in for a colonoscopy, and I do want all of my IBD patients to have a gastro. That's actually almost non-negotiable. Non mm. So if they're going in uh, for a colonoscopy, I like, you know, three days before they start prep, I like for them to collect this stool sample and drop it off at the lab to tell me about fecal calprotectin. Then they go through their prep and they go through the colonoscopy, and now I have images to match a number of the fecal calprotectin. So I use that one a ton. I also use um, either Diagnostics or Doctors Data. They have the Doctors Data is the CDSA, mm -hmm. and Diagnostics is called the GI Health Panel. I used to use a lot more Diagnostics. I recently moved to using more um, CDSAs, Doctor Data. But that tells me what kind of flora is in there. If there is yeast in there. Um, if there is parasites in there a little bit and uh, like how they're breaking down their food particles. And then the third thing that I use a lot of is a test called para wellness research, um, which is, he's, it's a test here in the States. Um, it, he's, it, he's one guy and he used to be a parasitologist. And so for years he was running standard OMPs out of the hospital and OMPs are uh, kind of a stupid test. Um, OMPs are taking like a very, very small microscopic uh, sample of stool and uh, magnifying it 10,000 times and looking for physical eggs or crawling parasites in the stool. They look at 10 fields. If they don't see an egg or they don't see a parasite, they call it a negative. And so it's a test 
that is uh, very specific, but not very sensitive. So if you get a positive, you definitively have a positive. If you get a negative, you just don't have a positive. Mm -hmm. uh, what he does is he takes the same sample, same stool, same preservative agents, but he looks well over a thousand times for at every sample. So he is also looking for a needle in a haystack. He's just doing a way better job looking. So do they have PCR testing yet for parasites or is that something that's not uh, done? Uh, Dr. Zeta does it. I actually don't think it's as accurate as para wellness. Okay. So you still, so just kind of differentiating between ONP and the PCR testing, um, because I'm always looking for PCR testing for obviously, uh, you know, different uh, pathogens mm -hmm. on a, on a stool and they do it for, I think, Giardia and, um, mm -hmm. well, actually they do it for, for Blasto and they do it for Dientamoeba as well here. And then they do it for the usual suspects for food poisoning, but I haven't seen it on, because uh, I usually use the Genova GI effects because of the PCR testing of microbiome assessment, which is all the yeah. anaerobes that they couldn't culture out before. Yeah. So that's something that's been really helpful for me. And I used to use, I, I love doctor's data, but they just, that piece was missing for me. Um, they but anyways, recently, mm. I feel like they recently introduced a, just a parasite test uh, that's mm. only parasites. And I think it's PCR. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think I've heard you talk about that para wellness and I I did refer a patient of mine that is in America to that to that lab and I think they did pick up um blasto that was previously missed. Um so it's some it's just something to keep in mind. So that's good to know. And so other other do you use other testing, you know, like naturopathic doctors and other functional digestive uh, specialists often use a range of other assessment tools like food allergies and things. Have you found them useful in IBD? So no, I actually, um, I, I have a pretty strong opinion about this and I, uh, so I, I Great. don't actually use food <laughs> allergy testing. Um, if I'm going to use any food testing, I'm going to use uh, Carol food intolerance testing, uh, which I do find really helpful. First of all, personally, my Carol test, I think is the reason why I am not on any medications. I, uh, you know, IgG testing, I find to be grossly inaccurate in these patients. Um, you know, IgG testing is looking for intestinal permeability. We know as a fact, if they have active Crohn's, they have intestinal permeability. That test is basically, they're going to spend $200 telling me what they've been eating on a regular basis. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't, I actually don't use food intolerance testing for those patients. A Carol, uh, sorry, food allergy testing. A Carol test is, you cannot get any more more naturopathic than a Carol test. I have seen no long-term studies on Carol tests. The amount of people that know how to calorie test are very few and far between, but clinically I do actually see a lot of efficacy with it. So you do that. Isn't that, I can't remember now. Can you just summarize it's, what that is again? It's so kooky. Yeah, mm. it's so kooky. It's, you, I mean, really, this is like <laughs> old school naturopathic medicine. Um, so a Carol test is basically looking at food intolerances. The theory is that you will, you know, certain, there are certain foods that your body will be able to digest and certain foods that they cannot digest ever. Nothing will ever change. Um, if you are intolerant to this food, you will be intolerant to this food for the rest of your life. Uh, they're testing a subset of foods, uh, they test dairy, they test potato, which is actually also gluten. They test soy, they test eggs, they test fruit, they test sugar, they test grain, um, mine salt, sea salt, and fish. Mm. And, and, so and potato is a big deal for them, right? Potato is a big, like yeah. potato. So my food intolerance is potato. Basically, so I can't have gluten because potato starch, a lot of the fortified grains, uh, they're fortified on a base of potato starch that then they put into the wheat, but wheat doesn't come up. Like they don't list potato on the flour because it's just known that this is part of the fortification process. Mm. So and you do this in your office as is something that you do. I do this in, yep. I do this in my office. Okay. Very good um, to know. So you need to find a practitioner that really knows how to do that. You can't order it online, for example. You can't order it online. Nope. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so sort of moving back into, um, um, IBD, there's a third, so we know about Crohn's, we know about ulcerative colitis, and then there is this um, other condition that I sort of just recently learned about in the last maybe three, four years because of the SIBO circuit, which is microscopic colitis. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that? 
Yeah, so microscopic colitis is, uh, they go in, you're having, usually you're having crazy chronic diarrhea, like 20 bowel movements a day. They're running fecal calprotectins and they go in with a colonoscopy. And if they don't take a biopsy, everything looks normal. However, right now, standard of care is to take a biopsy. Once they take a biopsy and they look at it under a microscope, they're finding this microscopic colitis on biopsy, which is why it's called that. There are two varieties, lymphocytic and collagenous. Uh, lymphocytic, about 80% of people have lymphocytic. Um, collagenous basically is when it's so far progressed, you have even more cellular changes. Um, it is, there's a, a couple of interesting things about micros uh, microscopic colitis. First of all, main symptom is urgent diarrhea that's unstoppable multiple times a day. No blood, no mucus, just Bristol 7 stools. Um, if you biopsy the large bowel, you would see that the biopsy looks very similar to a celiac patient's biopsy of the small bowel. So the villi are um, irritated and burned away. However, getting rid of gluten does not always fix the issue. So we think that there is some connection with having a gluten-free diet, but as opposed to celiac, where if you completely eliminate all gluten from your diets, uh, you will recover. That is not true for microscopic colitis. And that is really a disease that I think of, uh, you know, functionally, if the beginning of that orchestra of the intestine is not working well, you are putting excess strain on the large intestine. And because of that extra strain, it just, it gets inflamed microscopically. Hmm. And is there any connection to, I mean, you know, one of the, the things that, that I learned um, through this process is, I think it was actually Dr. Pimentel who first talked about microscopic colitis. Oh, and, with that case that he gave? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so it was just sort of unrelent, unrelenting diarrhea. And he usually says, that if you have a case like that, it's usually not SIBO, right? So don't think yeah, SIBO, totally. think more microscopic colitis, which is a really good little clinical pearl for those listening in terms of if you have like, I think greater than 10 bowel movements a day, um, this is usually um, not associated with SIBO. So, well, maybe not, you can said, have SIBO, but it's, it's yes. I would think more something else initially. There it is. Yeah. And you know, that makes perfect sense because if you think functionally with a large intestine, than does is it absorbs water. That's its job. And so if you have all this microscopic inflammation on the cells that should be absorbing that water, of course, you're going to have crazy watery diarrhea. Mm, mm -hmm. That's right. That, th that being said, I will definitely say that treating SIBO can somewhat help the microscopic colitis. But, you know, in the States, we are, as naturopaths, in Oregon, where I am, uh, we can prescribe medications. And, you know, those people usually need budesonide, at least for a short amount of time, like a three to five month window. Budesonide is a steroid that does not go as systemic as prednisone. It's a larger dose, but it does heal up that microscopic inflammation. And then you can do all of the other stuff that we do naturopathically that works so well for the intestine to make sure that it stays healed as you taper off the budesonide. Mm -hmm. Does microscopic um, colitis also have an elevated fecal calprotectin? Not necessarily. Hmm. Not necessarily sometimes, but not necessarily. It's not as predictive as um, Crohn's and uh, colitis. So the only way to really diagnose it is by, I think it's a rectal biopsy, right? They uh, Usually they do it with a colonoscopy, yeah. but they can do it with a sigmoidoscopy. Mm-hmm. Um, another really interesting piece that you presented on was the ileocecal valve pressure, which I think I first heard about from Dr. Mullen when he gave that presentation at the SIBO Summit via Skype, actually. And he talked about this study about mm -hmm. ileocecal valve pressure being really associated yeah. with SIBO. Um, and you mm -hmm. also mentioned that. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah. It, so, okay. Uh, so I also, I presented at the gastro AMP conference, um, this a couple of months ago. And I, what I did was I gathered all of these studies and it's, a, first of all, it's amazing how many studies have come out, come out in the last two years, basically showing that all of our naturopathic treatments that we've been talking about forever actually work. <laughs> However, this was a study from 2009. I think it was one of the few studies that were, were before 2015 that I had. And uh, the study talked about how they took this subset of patients with, um, uh, with IBD-like symptoms who might or might not have had a positive fecal calprotectin, uh, or they were re their recalcitrant, re uh, recalcitrant IBD. So basically IBD that is not responding to the biologic agents like Remicade or Humira or Simsia, not responding to steroids, not responding with mesalazine. So really just a difficult subclass to treat. And they looked at 
what's going on. And it turns out what they found in 2009 was what's going on with SIBO. They found bacterial overgrowth. And then they looked at why is this population so much more susceptible to bacterial overgrowth than somebody in the standard population? And it really came down to the fact that their ileocecal valve was often scarred, and so it was being left open. And so, you know, the way I like to describe it is when the ileocecal valve is left open, basically large bowel flora. So let's just let's go back at the bottom of the small bowel. If we took a millimeter sample and we biopsied, you would see about 25 billion um, bacteria per millimeter. If we went right on the other side of that closed ileocecal valve and we biopsy the very top of the large bowel, there would be a hundred billion bacteria. So uh, 10 to the third versus 10 to the 12th. Huge difference. If you have an open ileocecal valve, the bacteria from the large bowel can ascend and crawl upwards, and all of a sudden it's like the wild, wild west. There is all of this space for this large bowel flora, the microbiome, to reproduce and get comfortable and grow and bring their families and immigrate to the small bowel. And now you have basically, for all intents and purposes, two large bowels and no small bowel, which is causing a ton of inflammation in the small intestine. 80% of IBD patients, 80% of Crohn's patients have disease in their terminal ileum, which means a lot of them have scarred ileocecal valves, which is why they're so susceptible to SIBO. Hmm. And so what is the pressure? How, A, how do they assess the pressure? And mm -hmm. uh, B, what's the, you know, is there, are there other conditions like people, you know, post appendectomy, for example, uh, just sort of scar tissue that can scar the ileocecal valve or is it sort of exclusive to IBD? It's, it's not. So 20%, so on, they, they assess pressure by what, when they're doing a colonoscopy and they're at the bottom of the, at the top of the ascending colon, they usually like to sneak into the terminal ileum. Crohn's is usually in the terminal ileum. They take biopsies there. So on colonoscopy, they can measure the pressure. Which, but it's, not, it's not done on a standard colonoscopy, but uh, if they're doing a study like this, they're measuring the pressure of the ileocecal valve while entering it on a colonoscopy right? Mm. 20% of people have open ileocecal valves. I mean, that's like when you read your colonoscopy, you know, I get a ton of colon, I work with a lot of gastros. I get a ton of colonoscopy reports. 20% of people will just have an open ileocecal valve. It's just a common finding. Nobody, even, the gastros don't even think about it. And, and so, and why is uh -huh. that? Why is that? Like, is that like just <laughs> random or is there? I can tell you my theory. I don't know if literature supports my theory, but my theory is, you know, we eat diets, our standard American diet or our standard Western diets is extremely non-congruent with the way our digestive system should work. And so it's, you know, the theory that I think about is always, you know, here in the States, um, we have a ton of, we feed our cattle corn and corn is digested really quickly. And so the cattle don't have to regurgitate up the grass and then bring it down to the next room and bring it down to the next room. And, um, and so I think that's the same thing is happening with the West, people in the West. You know, the diet that we're eating is so low in fiber, so low in nutrition, so high in agro-raised cattle that, you know, their system stops working the way it should. Hmm. That would be my theory. I don't know if I have literature to support me, but I think it's a damn good theory. <laughs> it's a good theory for sure. And we love theories on this show. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody has one. Um, ex well, that's how breakthroughs happen is by people thinking outside the box and thinking laterally. Um, okay. So, so this back to this pressure, <clears throat> and this is something that, um, for those listeners who have, uh, you know, heard about this before or want to learn more about it. I actually, um, there will be a workshop with uh, Dr. Steven Sandberg Lewis here in Australia next November, so November 2018, on the the physical exam skill of functional digestive disorders. And he talks a lot about an old maneuver, which is the ileocecal valve maneuver, um, and sort of freeing an, uh, either a stuck open or stuck closed ileocecal valve, which I often do with my patients. And uh, maybe you can talk about it a little bit, Alana, because I'm sure I, you do I that. Just, yeah. So I just, uh, what I really want to do is I just want to plug Steven Sandberg Lewis. That man is amazing. <laughs> Where uh, me, him, and Gary Weiner are in the process of writing a book right now about inflammatory bowel disease. That man has been practicing GI medicine for so long. It's incredible. It's mm. incredible to sit with him and listen from him and learn from him. And the long, you know, I was lucky enough to have him as one of my professors when I was a student. Uh, his his information and knowledge 
is so vast. I cannot say if you have the opportunity to learn from him in person, you you would be crazy not to do it. Okay, that is all I'm saying. excellent. I, I figured that, but that's why I'm bringing him out here to. He's amazing. To, and it's going to be a very small group, only about a hundred practitioners, because you know there there's a lot of hands on, and you need to really uh, be taught properly on how to do that. And yeah. I found that to be really helpful to be, yeah. um, you know, assessing the ileocecal valve. To my knowledge, you can't really tell if it's open or closed, but you can yes. help your patient um, do a maneuver every night. They do it on themselves and it really helps to, do you find that, that when you give that to a patient that changes whether or not on repeat yeah. colonoscopy, there's less of the openness or? That is a great question. I, my answer is I don't know. That's mm. a really good question because I don't know if I remember to track it. Yeah, between, like, you know, there's so much to do, months. right? <laughs> yeah, so much to um, do with every person. I will say be between the ileocecal valve adjustment. And so the way that Steven can tell if it's open or closed is he uses, um, it's applied kinesiology. So he uses a form of muscle testing mm -hmm. to be able to check uh, if it's open via, you know, the autonomic nervous system. And um, so that's, that's the way he checks. And I, I just, I also want to say, I've been in this profession a long, a long time, probably 16 years now, um, since beginning my schooling, and I've been in practice for 10 years. And I remember starting school and being like, these guys are kooks, like, mm -hmm. what? oh my God, they're crazy. And now being out and watching the studies confirm everything that naturopaths have been saying forever, I'm like, wow, those guys completely knew what they were talking about. Isn't I have that a amazing? Little, mm -hmm. it's a, I, on Facebook, I'll put, my only thing that I ever post on Facebook is this um, column that says, uh, scientists quote unquote discover what naturopaths have been saying for decades. <laughs> It's it's mm -hmm. amazing how much these old naturopaths knew and this technique and then the other technique that I use a ton is the hiatal hernia maneuver. Have you do you do that? Yeah, well, I'm I uh, I do do it. Uh, I you know I uh, see a lot of people on Skype, so of course it's really difficult oh. to do that. Yeah. So, uh, but he, Dr. S uh, Samberg Lewis is teaching that. Uh, particular maneuver when he comes out here to Australia. So that's another one that's really super helpful for people. Super helpful. Uh, so much so that I will adjust people's hiatal hernias. And I do it slightly different from Stephen because I was tra uh, trained by Jim Sensening. Um, but people will, will be like, oh my God, I can breathe. Mm. Like they've had, uh, you know, ascended stomach for so long. It just changes the way you breathe. Mm -hmm. And I actually, you know, speaking of breathing, um, that lower esophageal, wait a second, yeah, it's, you know, it's the um, lower, lower esophageal sphincter that's actually sort of part mm -hmm. of the diaphragm, right? Yep, totally. So when, um, and I've been, there's another podcast that I did with Mim Beam, an amazing naturopath here in Australia who teaches proper breathing and buteco breathing. So oh, that's, that's um, yeah, so check that out. That's a, and he, she talks about <clears throat> nitric oxide release and uh, valvular relaxation when you actually uh, pr uh, breathe properly. So that's another missing link to this whole hiatal hernia story. But back mm -hmm. to IBD, which is um, our topic. Um, <clears throat> one big, uh, you know, sort of SIBO link is also hydrogen sulfide, right? So hydrogen mm -hmm. sulfide being the third gas that we don't test on a breath test, but um, has been implicated in ulcerative colitis, less so in Crohn's, but do you find that to be a big factor in the cases that you see? Definitely sometimes. <laughs> I'm, it's not as easy to say this is always going to be the causative agent, but I will tell you it comes up. So, you know, when I'm I'm treating UC. I treat UC differently than I treat Crohn's. Uh, may, uh, and that really has to do with, um, you know, UC. Uh, so UC is a condition that always starts at the rectum and works its way up. So any uh, proctitis or descending colitis, I'm going to do a bunch more local treatments. So enemas, retention enemas, ozone. I do a ton of rectal ozone. Um, I'm going to do that a lot more with UC patients. If that stuff doesn't work, then the next thing I'm going to do is parasite testing. If that stuff doesn't work, then the next thing I'm going to do is SIBO testing. And so they had to have failed treatments on a multiple, you know, on multiple different levels before we're finding it. So I feel like I'm probably, you know, getting rid of some, I'm just not seeing that because I'm not testing SIBO so early. I'm not seeing those hydrogen sulfide patients as, as easily. Mm. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I uh, have been fascinated by is really the hydrogen sulfide issue because it's um, a friend or foe. It has been 
um, shown to be beneficial to the mucosa and absolutely detrimental to the mucosa. <clears throat> so I've really looked at it um, a lot more in recent months and um, just actually interviewed Greg Nye, who has this very interesting theory. Oh, yeah. Super interesting. So that um, is something else that's um, by, by the time yours goes to air, probably his has already gone to air. So, um, it yeah, <laughs> it's so amazing. And he was also on the SIBO summit. That's how I, I learned about him on the SIBO summit, SIBO SOS summit. Um, and a completely yeah, he um, is amazing a way. He's, yeah, a, he's another of, Portlander. Yeah, I know you guys got it going on in Portland. I tell you. Um, yeah. so, yeah. so that, you know, looking at, and this is also something I learned from Dr. Jason Horlack, who is one of our superstars here in Australia. He's actually Canadian, but he lives in Tasmania and he's an amazing, um, naturopathic practitioner who uh, got his PhD in microbiome assessment and all that. He's the one with a probiotic database, right? Yes. Yes. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Um, okay. uh, oh gosh. Uh, probioticadvisor.com. And, um, so he, you know, I did this amazing workshop with him, um, just recently where we went through Ubiome and PCR testing through Genova and we looked at all the different phyla and and the but butyrate producers and the uh, hydrogen sulfide producers and that really changed my perspective also on um, how to actually manage these hydrogen sulfide producers. Of course Greg Nye's piece or he talks about another uh, researcher who escapes my name, uh, escapes my brain right now, but um, who really looks at sulfur metabolism. And so that's just so fascinating rather than looking at vilifying hydrogen sulfide producers like desulfa vibria or bilophilia. It's really about, okay, well, is it an upregulation due to, you know, improper sulfur metabolism? That's a whole nother theory, but it yeah. is something that Jason Horlack talks about in terms of that can't, you know, you do want to get these, these hydrogen sulfide um, producers down and using different techniques to do that, whether that's a prebiotic or changing the diet and reducing bile acids and blah, blah, blah. So I just wondered if you, if you do this kind of assessment or if you um, just treat it with antibiotics when you, I don't you know, there's no way here in Australia to assess for hydrogen sulfide. I don't know yeah. if you do that or is there a way? <laughs> So when I'm looking for hydrogen sulfide, I'm just looking for that flat line on that SIBO mm -hmm. test to give yeah. me a clue. From what I hear, Pimentel is close to uh, releasing a test mm -hmm. for hydrogen sulfide. It hasn't happened yet. Um, and mm -hmm. then, you you know, you can look for the hydrogen sulfide producers via U-Biome. Or right. um, I think the G does Genova's GIFX, does it show that too? Yeah, it, sh it shows only the sulfur vibrio. Um, and, yeah. But, you know, it gets complicated because apparently um, with sul uh, sulfur fixing or sulfur reduction, you have other interplays of other bacteria like Klebsiella and E. coli that, that can contribute to this whole process. So it's it's really looking at the environment. You can't just look at one. Yeah. I mean, you can. I had a, I actually wrote an, an article for NDNR for January for a case of hydrogen sulfide that was just a really fascinating. She had like zero butyrate zero short chain fatty acids and just sky high oh desulfovibrio yeah. and just managing that, you know, but anyways, yeah. it's just so relevant to ulcerative colitis in research. But again, it, there are pros and cons to hydrogen sulfide, but, um, if you don't do a lot of it, we can just move on. So, um, you know, let's kind of talk a little bit more about, uh, the use of biologics in, um, in, IBD. And just for the, for you listeners, one of the really exciting uh, prospects uh, or upcoming courses with Dr. Gorovich is going to be the sort of, I don't know the title yet, but the, the natural treatment of um, inflammatory bowel disease, which will be really co-management, looking at co-management and looking at all of these fantastic natural treatments that will help your patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So look at that um, coming up in 2018 on the SIBO doctor um, website. So Dr. Gurvich, biologics, so, pros and cons. Yeah. Um, God, uh, it's a very complicated question. And my answer is it depends. Uh, it depends when you've been diagnosed. It depends um, if you're on biologics or not. It depends on if we can get you controlled by other means. So a biologic agent, um, it started out with Remicade. Rem Most of the biologic agents started out in the rheumatology world, and they were around in rheumatology for somewhere between 5 and 20 years. And then so they used to use it for RA, um, 
and lupus and stuff like that. And then uh, they started doing FDA trials and then they brought it over for uh, Crohn's and colitis patients. Remicade is um, the oldest one. Remicade is an IV infusion. You start over the course of eight weeks, you get three infusions and then they infuse you anywhere between six to eight weeks after that. Um, the next one that came out was Humera. Humera is an injection. It's a subcutaneous injection. You do it every two weeks. You administer it yourself. It's painful, but at least you don't have to go into the infusions center. And the latest one is Simzia. And I say the latest one because things are changing in the biological world. Um, so Simzia has been out for like maybe five years. Uh, Simzia is the only one that does not cross the placenta. So it's the only one that's safe in pregnancy. They're all TNF alpha inhibitors. And for a long time, that was the only option we had. And just so you, just what, so your listeners know, the TNF alpha pathway, the original research on that was turmeric. And so uh, the when they looked at curcumin in particular, curcumin looks works on the TNF alpha uh, pathway. So they basically took this natural uh, derivative and they you know pumped it up on steroids, and now you have biologic agents. Um, there's uh, there's um, the new one that's out. It's a monoclonal Lucas inhibitor, I think, and that is called Antivio. That is only FDA approved in the States for ulcerative colitis. And then there's a bunch new that are in the pipeline. Um, Stialera, uh, uh, I can't remember, one that starts with an ST. Um, that is now coming out also only approved for... Crohn's thus far. And then what's coming out in the States is something called biosimilars. Biosimilars are basically generic biologics. And that I think has been through phase three testing and is now being used. It was, it's been used in Europe for a little bit longer and it's coming out into the States. Like basically right now they're trickling, trickling them out. Um, and there's a ton of new ones in the pipeline. So I think the conversation we're going to have about biologics is going to get bigger pretty soon. The trick with the biologic agents is they are biologic mimickers, right? So they mimic the TNF alpha pathways or the TNF alpha inhibitors. Um, and so what that means is you have the potential to form antibodies to these agents. So your body will be, re has the potential to treat the biologic agent as if in the same way that it's treating your intestine if you have inflammatory bowel disease. And so that's a big deal, especially if you take somebody off of it, the potential of them forming antibodies to it is significantly higher if you put them back on it. And so the reason why I say it's a trick question is because some people are going to want to get off the biologics. And I am never um, opposed to that if they are fully educated to the risks of what that means. And so if they had this agent that was able to get them into remission, that agent might not be available for them and other drugs in that class might also not be available to them. And you can also form antibodies to them even if you've never you know, gotten off of them. So it's a very complicated subject. And you know, my one of the big things, I feel like naturopaths who are not properly educated um, sometimes don't understand the risks of pulling a patient off of biologics. And, you know, I'm not opposed to pulling pe patients off of biologics. I just feel like the patient has to be really educated about potential risks so they can make an educated decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's something yeah. that, uh, you know, I do think that really needs to be sort of restated is that we do have a responsibility for what's right for our patient. And so when somebody comes to you on uh, one of these agents and rather than saying, oh, yes, we can treat it all naturally, you really do have to educate your patient on what the risk that that involves, which, as you just said, can mean that they once you stop that biologic that they develop an, an intolerant, like, well, an autoimmunity to it, I guess. And they're, they're no longer going to work for that patient. So I'm just paraphrasing what you just said, because it's important for, for people to hear that. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, and, you know, sometimes the medication is not the enemy. The disease, you know, I feel Mona Mornstein, um, mm. she, I, she's an amazing, amazing naturopath, also one of our old greats, and she teaches a lot about diabetes and diabetes and insulin. And she is like, you need to be really clear that insulin is not the enemy. The diabetes is the enemy. The inflammatory bowel disease is the enemy. And if they're on a biologic and they're tolerating it well, 
you you have to make an educated decision. And I mean, there are definitely risks with biologics. Like cancer is an increased risk with biologics. It's about one in 11,000. So it's not a crazy high risk, but it is a real risk to get lymphoma. It's a very scary medication. You know, if you're pregnant, that is another, uh, that's another really big conversation to have. But you, you have to have this conversation from an educated standpoint. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's why people should take your course, which is coming in 2018. <laughs> um, okay. So now we have about, <clears throat> about 10 minutes left and I want to kind of move into more treatments and, you know, mm -hmm. what people can do. I mean, people listen from all over the world, practitioners from all over the world. What are some of the, the really, you know, tried and proven Uh, protocol, not, maybe not protocols, but but either herbs or nutrients that you use for either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or both. Um, so uh, the one thing that I do a lot for acute cases is rectal ozone. Uh, and I know, I don't know how available that is in different parts of the world. Um, you know, in the U S you can buy a medical ozonator. It's not very expensive, you know, in the 3000 range and you can administer rectal ozone there. Rectal ozone is extremely anti-inflammatory and extremely fast acting. Um, it does. Uh, so the theory behind rectal ozone is basically ozone is very unstable. It's instead of O2, it's O3. We take oxygen and we electrocute it. So we break that very stable double bond. About 20% of that will reform in the O3. Uh, the way I describe it to patients is it's a super unstable molecule. It's a husband, a wife, and the girlfriend. Nobody <laughs> is happy. It's very uncomfortable. Um, what's happening if you're in an inflammatory bowel disease flare is uh, you ha you're shooting off reactive oxygen species or O1. That single electron is trying to break up other stable bonds, just like what happened with the ozone. If you introduce ozone into the intestine, then that third uh, oxygen finds that reactive oxygen species, they bind, it becomes stable, and it really shuts down that inflammatory cascade. Um, however, it is completely backwards. So uh, the large intestine is supposed to contract and push down, and we're pushing a bunch of air up and then expanding the intestine. And so usually after we administer treatments, they, that, that day they're more uncomfortable. We definitely, it might, uh, create a bowel movement or give you diarrhea. It might give you more cramping, more gas, more pain. Um, so it's not very comfortable, but it is, uh, the next day they usually feel better and have a reduction of their pain. So my acutes, what I'm thinking about, you're in an acute flare and you need to get out now. I think of rectal ozone. I think of elemental diet. Uh, elemental diet is extremely well studied for inflammatory bowel disease. It is actually as effective as steroids, but steroids have terrible, terrible side effects. And the elemental diet doesn't besides fungal overgrowth. That's a really serious uh, issue with the elemental diet. But if you can take them all off of all food and give them complete digestive rest, elemental diet is really helpful. And the third thing that I use a lot is uh, the specific carbohydrate diet, especially SCD intro. And so, you know, SCD intro is this, um, you know, three to seven day, very restricted, very strange diet, but it's got really good studies that the intro diet can decrease all of that inflammatory load. And so for acutes, those are the three things that I start with. If they get nowhere, then we start having a conversation about steroids because I can't have them bleeding significantly and in chronic pain for very long. There's too many risks that come with that. Um, Then we talk, then there's the entire, how do you chronically treat inflammatory bowel disease and how do you keep them out of remission? So, you know, the, for me, a Carol test is really important, um, because I'm trying to figure out their dietary triggers or a SIBO test is really important because I'm trying to figure out if SIBO is the underlying cause or a para wellness, um, parasite test is really important because I'm looking if the parasites are the underlying cause so that those are the, um, The, you know, I'm looking for testing and then, you know, there's so the, so the problem with inflammatory bowel disease is we have so many options and by no means do the same options work on every single person. It really is, you know, I, I tell patients I'm throwing spaghetti on against the wall and I'm trying to see what sticks. So some kind of, uh, GI lumen healing. Uh, some of the ones that I use are hydrolyzed whitefish protein, a product called C-Cure, or high-dose resveratrol, or glutamine, or, you know, in Portland, we just had, uh, see, marijuana just became legal, so I'll use uh, CBD and THC for some people, or... Um, 
Clostrum is another one. There's a product, Physica. It's one of my favorite new products. Physica is a really small company, and uh, I just learned about them, but they have this amazing product called Galt Fortifier, which is hydrolyzed whitefish protein and glutamine and clostrum and okra and um, mm. beta glucagon. Yeah, it's a good product. <laughs> um, so, so Galt I'll Fortifier, and it's by, by Physica. By, by, by P H Y S I C A? CA, yep. Okay. Um, I'll have a look at that's that. That's one of my new favorite ones. You always have to be uh, helping, giving them digestive support. So, enzymes, hyd um, hydrochloric acid, apple cider vinegar, um, mm. and, you know, probiotics. Do you have specific use, probiotics that you use? Or? So, I, I mean, we were talking about this before. I use a lot of Saccharomyces boulardii. Uh, I find it clinically extremely helpful. Um, I find that if they're having diarrhea, that it is one of those things that I can get. I, Saccharomyces can help me regulate uh, their diarrhea. And, you know, Saccharomyces, it, it blooms very, very quickly, but it dies off very, very quickly. So once they're stable for a little bit and I'm pulling them off of Saccharomyces, uh, then I'm in immediately introducing a probiotic for me that really matters on where their disease is is it large bowel if it's large bowel I'm gonna use higher um, counts if it's small bowel I might not use higher counts uh, fermented food mm. and then you know the last piece with this pa with these patients is um, you know if they've been sick for a really long time IV nutrition is really helpful mm -hmm. to help them feel alive again excellent um a couple of questions out of that was, do you find that there's a particular parasite that corresponds to different IBD scenarios? No, but I do feel like parasites definitely play a role. And so what are the top parasites that you find? Uh, okay, so it, that's a trick question because Portland uh, does not uh, filter their water, right? As on a, on a county level, Multnomah County does not filter their water. So much so that the state of Oregon just mandated that Portland install a water filtration system. And so when I'm running power wellnesses, I'm seeing a ton, a ton of crypto and giardia. Mm. Okay. A ton. Yeah, I live in, a, in an area where... Um blastocystis is absolutely endemic everyone we have yep. water tanks here in australia and we have wildlife that poos on the roofs and uh, you just get blastocystis you know it's just part and parcel of living here it seems um, and it's difficult to treat i think it's way more difficult to treat than crypto and giardia well it's because of these f five different subtypes or so but you know and it, it some of them don't cause any problems at all you can have you can test people and they're positive and you test the family and they're all positive and they're totally asymptomatic so it's it's really interesting organism actually um other question that i had about this was do you do butyric acid enemas or is that an outdated oh, thing i really want to i <laughs> uh, God, I, I read the studies, and I feel like anybody who's treated a uh, who's uh, treated a lot of IBD has tried them. I have never had success. Mm. I have never had success. I, I mean, I've I've tried them so many times. I was so helpful orally, rectally. It doesn't matter. I've never had to make a difference. Okay. All right. And do you, you know, in somebody that has IBD and SIBO, so what you're saying is that these acute flares of, of Crohn's are very likely to be SIBO. And do you treat them differently or do you just treat them? No. Yeah. I treat them okay. like, like they're a SIBO person. Right. Yeah. Okay. I just, I will, I'm sorry, that's not true. Uh, I will never, ever, ever, ever use uh, standard antibiotics on an inflammatory bowel disease patient, ever. Uh, rifaximine is a little bit different because it's a eubiotic, but these patients, it, basically the rule that my pa my patients know, the rule is they only get antibiotics if they're walking into a hospital. Mm -hmm. There is nothing that is gonna send these people into a flare as fast as an antibiotic. Not an herbal antibiotic. Herbal antibiotics actually do great with these patients, but antibiotics, neomycin, metronidazole, um, Cipro, Flagyl, any of those, they do not get my patients do not get antibiotics ever even the neomycin even the neomycin absolutely okay, neomycin good to is know. a bad guy yeah no really and uh, and i will tell you so you know i'm working on the book with uh, steven and gary and uh, they are not as um militant about this policy as i am i mean they're like yeah you know but sometimes we'll use neomycin and sometimes we'll use metronidazole my inflammatory i have mm. i have seen it way too many times the fastest way to get these people a flare is to put them on antibiotics mm -hmm. which just solidifies the fact that there is really an underlying dysbiotic feature of it is a microbiome we know it mm -hmm. we have the studies that support that 
-hmm. Why they're still getting antibiotics is beyond me. Fascinating. Osh, Elena, I've got so many more questions, but um, for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to leave it here because I think that uh, people are going to get a lot out of your course. And can you just uh, tell people, in case it's a patient listening, uh, where they can find you and uh, where you are located? So I am in Portland, Oregon. My um, clinic is Kwan Yin Healing Arts, K-W-A-N-Y-I-N Healing Arts Center. And I do do phone consults with patients, but um, I'm just really clear. I'm not, ask, I'm not acting as a physician. I'm a healthcare consultant. Um, I'm happy to listen to your case and give you suggestions, but I can't prescribe. I can't order a test. I can't diagnose. I can't treat. I'm just here to help you, guide you through. Okay, fantastic. Any last minute nuggets from you, Ilana? Yeah, I mean, I, in the, at least in America, for a long time, and actually they're still saying it, gastroenterologists say uh, inflammatory bowel disease has nothing to do with what you eat. I have mm. never heard such a ridiculous <laughs> statement in all my life. Uh, it is ridiculous to assume, you know, if you had a nickel allergy, you would stop putting nickel on your skin because it was an irritant. Mm -hmm. The same is true internally. The digestion is just the skin flipped inside out. And so you, diet is probably the most important thing about controlling these diseases. That is, I'm sure, preaching to the choir in terms of yeah. all of our practitioners listening and those learning about functional digestive disorders and more serious issues like IBD. Thank you so much, Dr. Gorovich, for your time with me today. And we look forward to your course on the SIBO Doctor. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the SIBO Doctor Podcast. We hope you found the information in this episode useful in the treatment of your SIBO patients. Thanks to our sponsors, SIBOtest.com, a breath testing service with easy online ordering, and Quintron, maker of outstanding breath testing equipment. Tune in again for another episode of the SIBO Doctor Podcast. Thanks again for listening.